Hello, everybody. My name is Jeannie Page. I am a member of the Entheo Society of Washington, which is based here in Seattle. We are proudly working in alliance with the Decriminalized Nature Movement, which is a national movement. And our mission is to expand public understanding and appreciation of natural plant and fungi medicines. We support the therapeutic, spiritual, and medical right to heal ourselves with entheogens and join together to decriminalize, destigmatize, and honor their use. I am super honored today. Um, this is our inaugural interview that we're going to be having for our new website and we've got the very infamous Paul Stamets um, known as the mushroom man with his hat of course made of mushrooms and with him is Dr. Pamela Crisco um, known as Dr. Pam. I'm just going to give a little brief bio of both of them and then I'm going to lead it into them. So um, Paul of course most of the people watching will know him um, as the mushroom man with his famous hat um, <laughs> And um, you are a man of many hats. Um, you're a speaker, an author, a mycologist, medical researcher, and entrepreneur, um, considered one of the intellectual and industry leaders in fungi, habitat, medicinal use, and production. Uh, you have your own company started in 1980, Fungi Perfecti, which sells exotic culinary and medicinal mushrooms and also conducts research and provides educational seminars to the public. You've written six books, I believe, um, including Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World, which I've just finished, and Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World. And just recently in 2019, you were featured in the documentary film, Fantastic Fungi, uh, made by director Louis Schwartzberg. And one of your main philosophies is that mycodiversity is biosecurity. And you see that preserving the old growth forests is a matter of national defense. And with him, we have Dr. Pam. Um, she's our medical expert. She's a clinical instructor of, in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia, so just to my north here. You specialize in chronic pain, counseling, and functional medicine. You've got years working in rural settings and with First Nation communities. Um, you've got deep knowledge of the safe use of MDMA, psilocybin, and ketamine-assisted therapy, which places you at the forefront of this new, rapidly changing paradigm. Um, I also know that you are extremely interested, the two of you, in the applicability of microdosing. And just recently in November, you launched this app um, with the Quantified Citizen platform, um, microdose.me, which was announced on the Joe Rogan Experience, um, and I believe has over 12,000 participants. So I know you'll come back to talk about that. Um, one thing I wanted to note, you are a total badass. Um, before you became a doctor, you were a firefighter, right? Um, not only a forest firefighter, which is so relevant for us right now in the Northwest, uh, which is why it really stuck to me, but also an urban firefighter. So kudos to you. That is, to go from that to being a doctor, wow, both of those things are pretty, pretty mighty. Um, you're also a founding member of the Canadian Psychedelic Association, which has been instrumental in the decriminalized nature movement, which has just recently brought an official petition to the Canadian government. So congratulations to you. Um, and I want to turn it over to you. I know you have some video that you want to show. I think with that segue, yeah, let's go ahead and um, let's show the video because it'll put it into context. Um, this is a, um, a patient who has been diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer um, and had high anxiety about um, the end of life and the meaning of life as we all have or will have. Um, and so I think her narrative uh, speaks volumes to this subject and the importance of it. So. I'm going to go ahead and, and let's see, Dr. Pam here can tell me how to share a screen. That was very, it's very difficult to get, to wrap your head around. I'm, I'm dying. The chances are that I'm not going to be around in a couple of years. heard about a network in Vancouver of therapists who are uh, treating patients with psilocybin, patients with anxiety and deal who are dealing with life and death issues. And I thought that really sounds interesting to me and, and there's no danger. I'm there with two other people in the room. And uh, so it's something I want to, it's worth trying because I, I need to be able to enjoy my life. And all of a sudden, everything was light and, and beautiful and warm. And, and uh, I felt just this rush of warmth and love and, 
and just peace come over me as, as the lights came up. I'm so fortunate that I had those connections that I heard about this uh, network of therapists that are willing to risk their licenses to treat people with this drug that's not not legal. And I think it's so wrong that people don't have access to this because people are in pain and dying and uh, or PTSD or depression and which studies show psilocybin helps all of those things and why are we not allowing people to have this drug but we allow them to have other drugs that are so harmful we have given people the right to die um, and and I think that's great it's I don't know if I'll be brave enough to choose that option if the time comes um, but it's there for people when they if they need it but what about living what do we do in between that part in the process of dying it's a long process sometimes so how are we going to help people through it do we want people to be living with the anxiety and fear or do we want to provide them a way to be able to deal deal with things that need to be dealt with in their life that are painful and hard um, but also to be able to experience the love and joy and peace that, that this has provided to me and to other people that I've talked to. This trip actually changed everything for me because now I'm able to live each day just with peace and joy and love every day and and not have this thing weighing on me. I feel so much healthier and lighter in a, in a way even though I have this thing inside me that could kill me but like I said today I'm not gonna die I'm good <laughs> and that's all that's all any of us have Wonderful. So moving. It's just, it's unbelievable. You know, I read um, Michael Pollan's book for the first time this summer, and I came to all of this as a completely ignorant person that was a child of the 80s, entirely brainwashed by Nixon's war on drugs. I was a peer leader as a high school student. I used to go to the elementary school and tell the kids just say no. Um, so when I read the book, and then I had my first journey with psilocybin, I, my first messages that I got was at anger. I was so angry. And when I learned, you know, all the research that had been happening in the 50s and 60s and how Alcoholics Anonymous had wanted to use this and all of it had been suppressed, it just, I was filled with rage. And I just immediately knew that I had to be on a mission. This has all happened for me within the last three months. And I'm so clear now, you know, looking at all the research, Johns, Johns Hopkins, of course, leading the way. You saw that Berkeley just announced their center yesterday or the, this earlier this week, which I'm so excited about. Um, so Dr. Pam, tell us, tell us about that. Tell us about what's the latest on the research. Um, where do we see this going? I know you've got a different perspective as a Canadian. Your laws are going to be different, but hopefully you can help guide us here. Um, tell us what you know. Thanks. Well, actually, I want to go back to something that you said about the anger. It's interesting because I, I just before this, I just got off a meeting with other medical colleagues. And that's a really common comment, is that when people realize that why these medications were taken away from medicine and patients was purely for political reasons and purely for racism, in, especially in Canada, that there was no science behind removing these from our toolbox. And so for 40 years, these medicines have been taken away for politics and racism, not for science. There's a lot of anger with that. Yeah. You know, for, for not only for, you know, just us as people, but us as doctors, you know, in mental health and chronic pain, our, our toolbox is small and these medicines are powerful. They're not for everyone, but for those who, that, who deserve it, they're a fantastic option in the hand of a skilled physician, therapist, counselor, or, you know, or just uh, in a spiritual or, or creative way. So, 
So a lot of us share that anger, but we're harnessing that into excitement to move it forward now that the doors are opening again. And yes, you're right. There's a lot of, of research going on. Um, Paul can show a slide that we we have or that he's created and we've created a bit together that show in North America, there are at least, if not more, 47 uh, so the studies on psilocybin. Do you want to pull that up? Um, yeah, that'd be and, great. Um, and 26 institutions, <clears throat> academic institutions in North America that are actively doing psychedelic research. So it's it, the, the doors are open. Here, yeah. We'll pull it up. While you pull that up, I know I've seen you know Dr. Roland Griffith said Johns Hopkins do his TED talks, and he talks about feeling like Rip Van Winkle, you know, that he's been asleep hibernating all this time, and just now able to come out and. It, it just feels like it's exploding. Yeah, I've seen this slide before. This is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So these are three slides. And um, Governor Inslee, if you are listening, I want you to pay attention. Um, and all medical researchers, uh, heart, these are the, the uh, institutions and universities currently engaged in this, the clinical use of psilocybin and psychedelics. Um, They've gone through uh, peer review, the IRB board, the institutional review boards uh, that are populated by experts and physicians for safety, for evidence-based medicine, uh, and they have progressed on to numerous clinical studies. Harvard Medical School, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, Penn State. Um, you can see, now, where is the University of Washington Medical School? I ask. I don't see it. Why? Well, there's an effort now. Um, being spearheaded by our good friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Back, um, who is trying to get the University of Washington Medical School on board. This is, the, this is a, a major movement in academia, in medical uh, academia. So some slides that Dr. Pam and I put together. Well, we were asking, well, what's the North American academic centers involved in psilocybin research besides those uh, that you saw? And the New York School of Medicine, Mount Sinai, um, it, again, numerous institutions if, and there actually are more than we have space <laughs> to be able to put up on the screen well let's go to europe and there's the european uh, institutions so this is evidence-based medicine and the extraordinary thing about psilocybin is there is its safety um and the broad uh effects uh that are positive in treating a wide range of mental illnesses. And moreover, Pam and I think um, in some physical illnesses, uh, these, these medicines will elaborate into. So I'm gonna show you about 10 to 12 uh, slides here, um, but they're pertinent. And then I'm gonna turn over uh, to my friend and partner here, Dr. Pam. So this is a by Dr. David Nutt, um, published in the Journal of Neuropharmacology on the um, the toxicity of psilocybin mushrooms compared to other commonly used drugs. Not only the harm to the users, but the harm to others. Their immediate family, we all know this. Alcohol, heroin has affected my family very deeply. And the implications and the ramifications of having um, a loved one addicted uh, to opiates um, it, 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 you know, it disturbs the whole family. It disturbs, you know, secondarily our neighbors and everyone else involved in the community. So uh, it's just not the one individual as others, but look at mushrooms. Uh, basically they are on the extreme scale of non-harm and non-toxicity. Uh, in fact, um, we know of no LD50 uh, for psilocybin. Warfarin, uh, digoxin, lithium, if you end up misprescribing or miscalculating the dose, it can kill you. Uh, what happens if you take 10 times more psilocybin than you estimated you should take? Well, not death. In fact, it could be a more deeply spiritual experience. Um, but this is, um, all kidding aside, this, is, this speaks to the fact that psilocybin is extraordinary, even by the FDA statements is the one least toxic and most significant medicine ever studied uh, by the FDA. This is why it's gotten such widespread approval by the FDA. The decriminalizednature.org movement, of which you're a part and we're a huge supporter of, 
uh, the decolonization and legalization of psilocybin for therapeutic use is on the ballot uh, in Oregon, statewide ballot. It's made the ballot in Washington, D.C. Um, of course, we know about Santa Cruz and Denver uh, and Oakland uh, decriminalizing it, which basically, for the most part, they, they made it the least important priority of law enforcement, and no public funds could be used for the prosecution of people possessing or cultivating uh, for personal use. So basically, if a law enforcement officer arrested somebody for psilocybin mushrooms and brought it to try to bring it to the court, uh, the prosecutors have no budget for that. In fact, it's a violation of their duty to office to even pursue it. Um, so, and you know, I know a number of law enforcement officials and for years, they, they I've had martial arts schools for many, many years, so I had many of them as students. And um, they wanted, wanted several of them confessed to me, they love pulling over people with the Grateful Dead stickers. They're always apologetic. <laughs> they smell like cannabis, but they never are belligerent. You know, you pull over something on like methamphetamines or alcohol, you know, you've got a problem, right? So they, uh, they were very happy on the legalization of, of marijuana in Washington State in particular. So a little aside there. But so, and then in Canada, the, the Theracil movement, you know, that Dr. Pam uh, talked about, and we'll be talking about more. So, I this is a, this is I also made this for Theracil. It's here I'm talking head talking about myself. Pardon, pardon that, but it synopsizes something that I think uh, a lot of us hold uh, uh, dear to our hearts. So, 57 seconds on me. There's two things certain in life: we are born and we die. Where do we come from? Where are we going? With the psilocybin mushroom experience, you suddenly know that you're part of a giant oneness. And it gives you context and consolation about your own mortality. So I think it's critically important that at the end of your life, you have a right to these substances. Who dares say that you do not? When these have been used for thousands, probably tens of thousands, maybe millions of years, and laws have been created to ostracize people to use them only in the past 50 years? I mean, it's, it's, it's not only academically naive, it's immoral. And it's, I, I think that everyone has a right to how they can leave this life. So I want to reflect a little bit on my own history. I uh, was covered by a Drug Enforcement Administration license uh, through the Evergreen State College. Uh, the Evergreen State College is a liberal college outside of Olympia, Washington, really founded because of the efforts of a Republican governor, Daniel Evans, um, who became the president of the Evergreen State College. Uh, when I wrote my first book and we had a DEA license, I met with him in his office. Um, he was a conser fiscal conservative, but he was also a person who understood that imagination and pushing the envelope of conventional thinking was the key to evolving our society. So a big, deep uh, nod of gratitude to Governor Daniel Evans um, and, uh, and Governor uh, Inslee, I hope you follow suit. <laughs> I guess I'm getting kind of, kind of <laughs> uh, That's kind of why we're there. here. <laughs> okay, so I published four new species in the genus Psilocybe. The, the Drug Enforcement Administration license was covered by my good friend and mentor, Dr. Michael Bug, and we collaborated for many years. And so Psilocybe azurbescens, liniformans, sinofibulosa, and Psilocybe wileyi are four of the species that I've published. I have a few other ones that have not made it into publication yet. This is just an analysis based on the research records of the potency of psilocybin in certain mushrooms. Um, psilocybin is a prodrug to psilocin. So when you consume psilocybin, psilocybin does not get into your brain. It's actually psilocin. So dephosphorylates through the enzymes in your stomach. Uh, you have a lot of receptor, neuroreceptors actually in your stomach as well are activated. And as the psil psilocybin converts to psilocin, then it gets into your bloodstream. Now, um, so these mushrooms that have high amounts of psilocybin and very low amounts of psilocin, like the second species, Liberty Caps, Psilocybe semilanciata, do not bruise bluish. The majority of the Psilocybin mushrooms that have psilocybin and psilocin to a substantial content bruise bluish. So bru bruising bluish is one feature, but not necessarily 
exclusively the only feature for identifying psilocybin mushrooms. The general rule is if a mushroom, a gilled mushroom, has purple brown spores, um, is, uh, is bruises bluish, uh, and growing on wood chips, um, that puts you into the 90% category plus that is a psilocybin active mushroom. However, don't take my word for it. Join a mycological society. When in doubt, throw it out. Consult with experts. Don't go out foraging mushrooms on wood chips as there are some deadly poisonous species that grow on wood chips concurrently with psilocybin mushrooms, oftentimes side by side so close that they are touching. And I put these photographs in my book, Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. So let's look at some meta uh, surveys and we'll come back to our, our app, microdose.me that Pam and I collaborated on. This is a meta survey from DSAHS on prisoners, 480,000 people surveyed. And they didn't go into this survey with this intention. This is a signal coming from the noise of the data. And they found that psilocybin use was associated with a 27% decrease odds of larceny theft, 22% decrease of property crime, 18% decrease odds for violent crime. So the association of psilocybin use is directly correlated to a decline in criminality. Another study showed that it significantly was associated with a decrease in partner-to-partner -partner violence. Now, we have reduced criminal behavior, reduced violence. How can you measure the benefit to society? Um, it's such an extraordinary benefit. It's hard to overestimate uh, the importance of, of this data. So this is what really inspired Dr. Pam and I to dive into meta-analyses. And she was really excited about, you know, the meta-analyses that have been done in, in, in medicine have found unexpected uh, benefits. Again, signal coming from the noise of data. Um, so we work a lot with statisticians specifically on this subject. Now, these meta surveys are based on psilocybin mushrooms, not on pure psilocybin or psilocin. This is important to consider. So, it also, with pure psilocybin in clinical studies, there is a greater relation uh, and empathy to people's facial expressions. Uh, there is a greater ability to, to um, feel um, other people's pain, to to help them um, get through their trauma. There's a, there's a, a, a understanding of the importance of empathy. Uh, so this is, I think is significant. And a therapeutic reset is, uh, is proposed. And John Hopkins spoke to this quite eloquently in their studies. What is surprising to me with PTSD and other types of traumatic events is that through one session, sometimes two, uh, six-hour sessions with psilocybin, um, when people re-remember the psilocybin experience a year or several years later, re-remembering the experience gave them further consolation to rise above their PTSD. So the PTSD was not the anchored memory. It was the psilocybin experience resolving that trauma that became the primary anchored memory. So these mushrooms are non-addictive. I like to tell people who have not tried them, those of us who've consumed them, after a heroic dose on psilocybin, the next day you look at them and you say, no way, I'm not taking those to that. Yeah. Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they are, they are anti-addictive by nature uh, because the effects are so profound. Um, there's increased nature relatedness and and a decreased uh, tendency towards authoritarian political views. I think that's significant. And right now, yeah. <laughs> and and not only nation related, another study is pro-environmental behavior, which is important now because our ecosystems are so uh, much in stress. So in the, state of, in the state of Washington, in British Columbia, and in Oregon, fortunately, we have a culture of mushroom gathering and mushroom hunting. So many people hunt chanterelles and pine mushrooms and morels in the spring. So this is part of our natural, you know, behavior, uh, going out in the woods and taking our children, et cetera. Now, if you were in some other 
you know, like Arizona or some other state that didn't have mushrooms popping up all the time, mushrooms are looked upon as being very alien, bizarre. Um, here is part of our culture. So that's one of the reasons why I think the, the, this, this movement is really strong, particularly here in the West Coast and in Colorado, which have lots of mushrooms as well. Okay, so I want to now back off on this. Um, and then we're going to come to the meta analysis of our microdose app. Well, Do you want to explain the microdose I, yeah, app? Yeah. Yeah, well, what we did here, um, Jeannie, is that there was a there was a lot of study, or um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, and there is a lot of literature, you know, around with Jim Fadiman and Torsten Passi, that were um, they were writing and publishing on um, microdosing, and um, and then there's a lot of press that was coming through the Silicon Valley with uh, the coders that were using LSD to optimize their coding ability. And I found this all very interesting and I just kind of, kind of, you know, followed it a little bit. But what really caught my attention was when I had, within a very short time, I had two uh, different close friends um, who were suicidal and were microdosing, um, turn around their suicidality within a week. And that really caught my attention. As an MD, I work in the ER often and suicidality is, um, of course, an issue. And so, um, you know, and then also, you know, the, the wheels just start turning. And Paul had talked time uh, many times in his talks about having anecdotal stories about uh, hearing going up from somebody who was, you know, on a psilocybin dose that they could hear, you know, ants walking. And I thought, well, it's all, everything that's been published or, or written about on microdosing is interesting. But as an MD, I want to know what, who I should be telling my patient, like which of my patients should be microdosing, if any. So what we did is we put our heads together um, and we, we pulled in a, a team at Quantified Citizen, some programmers who were very keen on this and uh, Dr. Zach Walsh, Walsh from UBC. And we created an app that measured a whole bunch of things that are medically interesting. So not only mood, which we already knew microdosing help mood and depression from stories, but it hadn't really fully been studied. So we, we created the app that could follow your mood, follow your anxiety, follow your, your creativity, but also things like your hearing and your vision and your memory and your reaction times. And it was launched in November. And we had um, a little bit less than you thought, it was about 10,000 people that got on the app and some super users. And we have so much data right now from it that we're, we're, it's, we're really having to do a lot of work to tease out the findings. But our thought around this is we could really crowdsource a lot of data here and find out where the signals are. And then we can use those signals by, you know, it's, it's not, this is not the highest quality study, but it is a study that pulls a lot of data out. And when we see the signals, now we can dive in because research is expensive. So yeah. now we can dive into some of these signals and, uh, and, and do a better quality study. And then we're gonna have the data that we'll, we'll need to know exactly who should microdose and for what indications. Yeah. So here's, I think this will launch. Yeah, so this is just a little bit of what the app looked like just so people know. Um, people can still sign up for the study. It's three months. We will be launching uh, another one, uh, version two, because we've learned a lot from this this app, we've gotten a lot of fantastic feedback from the users on what they liked, what they didn't like, and a lot of feedback from other researchers who want, who are excited about the fact that, you know, we, we got so many users in this study so quickly. I think Jim Fadiman said we got, we got more users in one week than he got over five years. Mm -hmm. So pretty, pretty positive. So this is a, this app is available uh, for Apple devices right now, um, and it will be um, uh, available for the Droid apparently um, coming out after the first of January. So now what's so interesting about the data that we're going to show you, which we first revealed the day before yesterday at the University of Arizona Medical School conference, Science of Consciousness. So the data we're going to show you. Um, today is the first uh, display of this data outside of an academic medical institution. Um, and the big question that Dr. Pam and I have had is um, the fact of the matter is 99% of people using psilocybin are using it in the form of psilocybin mushrooms. 
Psilocybin as a pure pharmaceutical is not yet available except for clinical studies under very tight uh, restrictions. It's, no long, it's not prescribed yet. yet. So even after the legalization of psilocybin as a prescription drug, even after that, 99% of the people are still going to be using psilocybin mushrooms. Right. Why wouldn't you? You can go out and find them for free. You can, you know, many people grow them. Um, you know, so why do you have to fund a pharmaceutical, you know, company when these things get you out in nature? And as we know, this nature you know, uh, is a big part of this experience. Um, so um, we are excited in developing a, a clinical study to compare psilocybin mushrooms to psilocybin. No one has done that yet. If you can standardize a mushrooms to the same percentage as psilocybin, then is psilocybin mushrooms equal, less, or better than pure psilocybin? It's a very good question. Because you can grow psilocybin mushrooms in the price of portobellos. And psilocybin in pure form is anywhere from five to $20,000 a gram. So, you know, what about the universality of use? So many low income people are suffering from trauma even more so because of COVID. Right. And so we have these discussions a lot about the affordability of a medicine for the benefit of the commons and the greatest number of people. You bracket that with all the absolutely essential concerns about safety and public safety, personal safety, um, you know, the, the underground criminal black market drug scene. Um, very pertinent relative points of discussion, uh, but there are, I th think they are not obstacles for the greater public benefit that we can do and have in reducing criminality, reducing the stress on the courts, reducing the stress on the prison systems, reducing, making criminals out of innocent people who then are taught to be criminals in the prison system because they feel such injustice for being incarcerated in the first place. All those things, the net public benefit I think is is exponentially in favor of public benefit compared to the risk of public harm. So, can we continue, or do you want well, to add? I, do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'm saving them. I'm saving them. So, yeah, go ahead and show us the data, and then I'm going to have a flurry of questions for you. Okay, fantastic. Take it over. Well, like I said earlier, we have so much data from the microdosing study that we're just beginning to start teasing out. So, one of the first things that our grad student is looking at um, is uh, we're, 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 so in it, people could come in microdosing anything, not just psilocybin. We, we just asked. We didn't, we didn't tell them what to do. We just asked, what are you doing? So we had quite a few people that entered the study that weren't doing any microdosing and just did all the assessments, which was great. Now we had built-in control, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. We had people that came in that were doing microdosing LSD, MDMA, and psilocybin, but by far the majority were, were uh, microdosing psilocybin and that might just be a that might be an artifact of the fact that you know Paul is involved in it you know and a lot of his followers know about the study from him too but um, so we we broke it down uh, can, some of it do you wanna... can you define what a microdose is oh yeah okay so what we did is we we went through the literature with Jim what, what Jim Fadiman had had published and what Torsten Cassie had published and what people were uh, blogging on it and talking about anecdotally. So we uh, we put it as a low and a medium and a high microdose. So I think we have our uh, on the next one. Oops. Yeah, go back one. There it there, is. There we go. So there we we in the study we this is how we uh, define the low dose. So low dose of psilocybin is less than 0.1. And then you can see here, I'm just reading off the slide, the medium is 0.1 to 0.3 and the high dose is over 0.3. So you can see that the majority of the respondents are in that middle zone of what we, what we labeled as the medium dose. Um, we had mostly mostly men, uh, but we had about 30% women. Well, that may be an artifact of the Joe Rogan uh, podcast. Right. So, um, because I was pretty shocked when I saw how few women uh, were represented here, but then I realized more men watch Joe Rogan. Yep. And we first announced this uh, on Joe Rogan. Also, um, Pam has a wonderful phrase that they use in medicine. A microdose is considered to have subsensorium, 
below the, the uh, ability of you to sense a difference. So a microdose, by definition, if you take these mushrooms and you feel something, then that's not a microdose. A microdose is subsensorium. Um, so, um, can I? Go yeah, ahead? yeah. Okay, okay. I think Paul should talk about the data. He, bring, <laughs> he brings out the excitement of it. Well, okay. So we have the non-microdosers. That to me was a is is the, really the uh, uh, it validates this data. We had all these people um, who did not do any. Um, psilocybin mushrooms whatsoever, um, and this is their depression score. It's called the DAS scale, the depression, anxiety, and stress scale. It's widely used in psychiatry, and this is a one month long. Um, people um, coding in their information almost daily, and their difference in the decline in depression over a month is negligible. Um, however, of the uh, of the number of people who are microdosing, look at the improvement and the reduction yeah, in the DAS score of those people who are microdosing. And that p-value of significance, for those who, this is a scientific, a statistical, um, uh, analytical measurement. And the simplest way to explain it is a p-value of 0 0.05 means you have 95% confidence that the data is valid. So when you go 0 0.01, you're 99% confidence, right? So 0 0.001, you're 99.9%. .9%. It's unambiguously clear that the data is valid. Um, so, and then on the anxiety, well, depression and anxiety are interrelated. You know, I would suggest that in these COVID times, you may not be depressed, but you have, may have greater anxiety. Um, and then maybe depression comes subsequent to anxiety. I don't know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'm, I think this is very, very interesting. This is amazing. Look at the p-value significance in just positive mood versus the non-microdosers. Wow. This is astonishing. Um, and of course, this has not yet gone through peer review. Uh, Dr. Pam and I, and Dr. Zach Walsh, um, and the other uh, uh, co-inventors and uh, graduate students are all involved in writing up this data for peer review. Um, but never mind, as a baseline for justification of clinical studies at the University of Washington Medical School, I hope, um, you should pay attention to this. This is not just some hippies tripping on magic mushrooms and you know, doing underwater basket weaving. Uh, this, is, this is really significant. Um, that phrase, by the way, was associated with the Evergreen State College for a long time. <laughs> you could get a degree okay. in underwater basket weaving was a big criticism at the Evergreen State College. <laughs> so again, I just want to I just want to emphasize something Paul said. This is this is not peer reviewed yet. This is just preliminary data. We're just crunching the numbers. This is only four weeks of the three months. Um, so we're seeing good drops in depression, good drops in anxiety, improvement in positive mood and decrease in negative mood. So, you know, we have a, we have a lot of, we, we have, like I said, we have so much data. It, we, we have the challenge of abundance of data here. Yeah. So, so we're hoping that, you know, we can, we can start to really um, plow through it and, and start presenting it. And we also have in the microdose.me uh, app, we have, um, as Pam alluded to, we have hearing, we have visual acuity, uh, we have coordination tests, because uh, we know that these mushrooms and the compounds, psilocybin, their analogs, uh, regrows nerves. It's called neurogenesis. And this is really a, a much bigger story than just emotional, you know, depression or mood or anxiety. This is basically, we all suffer through some form of dementia as we age. We have neurodegeneration. What we're able to show now, very convincingly, I think, is that these psilocybin analogs, which are related to serotonin, a natural neurotransmitter, causes neuroregeneration. And it looks like it's directly tied to cyclic AMP, which is one of your major energy cellular building blocks. So, um, yeah, so we'll take a, a, a pause here for some questions, and then we have the other shoe to drop, okay, <laughs> which we'll, we'll talk um, about. 
That is so awesome. So I have to just say my own background, I, I've struggled with anxiety and depression as an adult, and I've had tons of healing through yoga and meditation. I've already had a 10 year meditation practice. So when I found my way to mushrooms, it was as a long term meditator, which I think made it that much more impactful for me. Um, so to see those slides, even though it's not yet peer reviewed, it's just like, whoa, you know, it's unbelievable. Only four weeks to see that change is amazing. So I, I really feel like, and you know, you mentioned that this isn't just a bunch of hippies weaving underwater. One of the reasons why I really wanted to get involved in this movement is because, I, you know, I'm a professional person that is not at all considered a hippie outside of my yoga world. Um, but it'll shock people that I know that I'm involved with this. So I feel like that gives me credibility to be able to help get it, the message out to people that aren't really that open to it. Um, so that's really my intention. Um, I have so many questions. So I'm wondering, I'm going to tie a few things together here. So Paul, I know um, your original story of being up in the tree um, when you were, was it 19, 18, you were 18 and you took that heroic yeah. dose, right? Um, we talk about I, one of the things, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's about right. It wasn't yeah. 18, I was not 19 to 20. Okay. One of the, um, things that's very important to us as an organization is, the, is stressing the importance of set and setting, right? To make sure that you're in a safe setting. And clearly that was not the case for you at the top of the tree. Um, but I know that you did overcome your stutter. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I, I still stutter because, um, and for a stutterer to be called out on their stuttering for any stutterers out, the, out there, this is like I'm on the edge of the cliff, right? So this is really tasks me even more. But those of you who've seen the, the movie, The King's Speech, uh, if you haven't, please, I went to the theater, I saw that movie, I shrunk in my chair. It brought back so many childhood memories and I was very much traumatized by my stuttering habit. My stuttering habit was a type of stuttering um, that I don't stutter when I speak to animals. I didn't stutter when I would sing. And I didn't stutter obviously when I talked to myself, but I would stutter whenever I saw anyone. And actually it kind of led me to mushrooms because I didn't want to make eye contact because I was so embarrassed to, to speak and to stutter. So I looked at the ground and I found fossils and mushrooms. <laughs> so that's what kind of got me into the mushroom scene is just avoiding eye contact. Um, so, you know, I'm greatly heartened that uh, Joe Biden uh, is a former stutterer. Yeah. And thank you, Joe, for his compassion. Um, and my advice for anyone encountering stutterers, it is just so evil that people make fun of stutterers. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to, to make them have, you know, be more humiliated? Are you trying to make yourself look better than someone who's disadvantaged? I'm gonna come off of it, it's cruel. So if you're with, with a stutterer, just be kind. You know, if they feel comfortable, you know, touch them so they're relaxed. It's a huge social stigma. And I was told by one physician in physiology that some of us stutterers, uh, when we're in the womb to six to seven months, um, we have a neurological defect basically um, that, and when you get into a pattern of stuttering, it's hard to get out of that pattern. And I think it's basic to neurophysiology. You have a, a neurophysiological connections that are, you know, tried and unfortunately tried and true, but you use them a lot. And then you are, that's what you're settled into. And so what psilocybin did, and I think the evidence shows uh, for many other examples, it breaks uh, that sequence of neurons are using. And so all the stutterers, for the stutterers are out there, they can relate to this. Hey, that will go on for 30 seconds, folks. And one way of breaking out of that is we would invent a prepositional phrase totally out of the blue to trick our mind and then we'd break out of it. So it makes for better Scrabble players because <laughs> you're always coming up with new words. Um, though I've been losing at Scrabble lately. Um, so, um, but this is the type of thing it does. It able, it's able to help you um, develop, I think, new neurological pathways. And I have been saying this for many, many years until recently now we have the evidence. So can we go on to the evidence? 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask one question about that. So I know you mentioned Joe Biden. Did you see the young boy that he had at the DNC with the stutter that got on national and spoke on national TV? Did you see no, that? No, I didn't. So you should no, find that clip because he Biden had him on there speaking and the kid was so brave. He was maybe maybe 10 to 12 ish um, and spoke openly about his stutter. And I thought of you and I thought, gosh, could there ever be a day when we could see microdosing FDA approved and being used to treat a child like that with a stutter? And I guess that's a question for Pam. Like, is that within the realm of possibility of what we're talking about here? Yeah, I think it is in the realm of possibility. When we find in, in research studies, when we find things are safe for adults, when we when studies go through this the phase one, phase two, phase three, and you find the safety data, quite often the next requirement is then to take it to a younger level to then go, is it safe for people under 18? And then if you get the data that it is in fact safe for teens, then you can make the argument to do phase one safety trials in children. Um, I think it, it's it's hard. It's really hard to get ethics for studies in children and in pregnant women uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I think the way we're going to perhaps uh, move into that is uh, via something I've been doing for two to three years is collecting case studies. So I have a number of case studies um, of accidental ingestions of psilocybin by children with remarkable outcomes, oh like gosh. remarkable outcomes. Like one one, uh, I'll just truncate the story. It was an accidental ingestion by a child that um, had extreme eating disorders. I believe the child was seven or eight years old. Extreme eating disorders and extreme conduct disorder I'm in, in uh, such that there were locks on the cupboards and the fridge, et cetera, for the food because the child would just devour everything. And an accidental ingestion of psilocybin mushrooms at someone else's house and complete resolution the following day. So she had a, what would be considered a spiritual dose for an adult in a oh child. God. There, Fortunately, there was a physician involved and they went to the emergency and it was just a watching and, you know, it was, you know, at first horror and then wonder, you know. So I wouldn't advise anyone to follow that because I can't do that as a physician, but I'm definitely collecting these cases. And there's a number of other cases like that of accidental ingestions that were either had some sort of resolution or, or no effect whatsoever. Well, one precautionary uh, note I would like to mention is um, since so many people put uh, psilocybin mushrooms and chocolates, label your chocolates, please. <laughs> Keep them out of the reach of children. I mean, who, do, who would not want to go into a refrigerator to find some chocolates to eat, yeah. right? So, Let's hope that's common um, sense, but it's a good caution. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I do have some questions for you about the movement in general, the, the decriminalized movement, but I, I know you want to show me something else. Which would you rather do first? Well, I think we're going to be running out of time. So um, I think. We'll, well, ask your question. Ask your question. Yeah, yeah, so my question is just, so we're, we're planning to take the route, um, not that Denver and D.C. did. They did They put it on the ballot and go to the people. We're, we're intending to do um, going straight to the city council. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or recommendations on that. Of going directly to the people? Is that what you're saying? We're going directly to the city council versus is having a ballot initiative. So it'll be a Seattle. Um, We're going to start. Uh, so the, the plan is to start with Seattle and then eventually, once we decriminalize it here, then go to the state legislature. Well, I'm not a strategist on ballot initiatives and politics, and I would defer to the experts that you've consulted with. Um, there are so many successful movements and experiences. Um, the, when you bring up the words legalization, it's very different than decriminalization. Yes. Yeah. So. This is the idea, I think, was just the Aikido approach from a lawyer's point of view, is to reduce the enforcement of psilocybin as the lowest priority, not lower, not mid-low, not number 10, the lowest priority of law enforcement. Yeah. Um, you're not legalizing it. You're just saying, we're not going to put public funds to prosecute. I think that's a first good step. I think the second step that is much more significant is the therapeutic use of these um, by qualified medical practitioners. The third, I think, is to have CGMP certified facilities that could legally grow psilocybin mushrooms and provide them at microdosing levels uh, and then by, by, by prescription. And then the therapeutic use, of course, would follow the John Hopkins model, et cetera. 
but I think that psilocybin mushrooms afford greater neurogenic benefits than psilocybin as a molecule. Yeah. And that's what I want to talk about next. Do you think that, just one last question on that, I know you support the Oregon uh, PSI 2020, is that correct? That would give, um, that would legalize psilocybin therapy with a licensed practitioner. Are you a supporter of that, I believe? Yes, yes, okay. I am so, a supporter of that. I'm on uh, also the, the board of advisors for developing the protocols over the next two years before this will be instrumented. Um, so one of the questions actually that came from Carlos, who's the head of the national movement in Oakland, he was really curious if you see any conflict of interest there with that model being where, whereby licensed therapists would have the legalization to do it. Could that create scarcity of them opposing the rights of people like me being able to use it to criminalize? So basically, do you think that those two models are- I don't, I don't, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a gradual slope Okay. You know that leads to um, there, again, responsible use. We have all these different models, these different pathways. Some of them are really rapid, some are more measured. Uh, we will learn from our successes and mistakes. So I think having a multiple approaches gives us um, an educational environment to understand how best to do this. So I, I'm this sort of authoritarian, my way or the highway, or or you're taking psilocybin away from the people, folks, they already have it. <laughs> you're not taking it away yeah. from them. Uh, so I think the decriminalization and not putting people in prison or jail, you know, my, my, one of the funniest, uh, I mean, I, I have two or three quick stories, but I was called in as an expert witness in the 70s because a whole bunch of young people in colleges would be swooped up by law enforcement, all picking liberty caps. You know, um, they were look like they're looking for contact lenses in the football fields. You know, they're all stooping, so they heard them up. And, and so I was called an expert witness. And the judge, that one judge, was just so happy I was there um, because it was a violation of Biden's right to due process to expect every uh, citizen to be a, a mushroom taxonomist, whereas everyone knew what a marijuana leaf looked like. So. That's common knowledge, but what does philosophy sylvicula uh, or uh, sylvatica look like? I mean, so it's is it not? It's beyond the general knowledge base. So, um, but the other thing was quite funny is that the biggest patch of philosophy sign lessons I've ever seen was directly outside the Thurston County Jail, <laughs> the back entrance. Have you been there in Olympia? Those slopes of wood chips are covered. Now, folks, you don't go there now, and I wouldn't advise it. They got cameras everywhere. Um, but it was really amusing. These mushrooms tend to show up around institutions like law enforcement, courthouses. You know, it's around Microsoft's campus. Computer. It's around yeah. Google's campus. It's around <laughs> Apple's campus. You know, and I think that's probably why many of the employees there are microdosing. They realize, oh my gosh, these things are growing outside right my window. So. And also, I think, I think the, what's really important and is that we really understand <laughs> historically why these were taken away. I think as soon as people, and I would, I would suggest that for one of your soonest webinars, is when people understand there was no science, that we were, that this was propaganda and it was for a reason, then you can have a really adult scientific conversation around it and the tittering goes away and people can lean in and look at the science just like we do for everything else right Very that's tough. that's we don't we shouldn't have to come over that hurdle anymore we can lean in as adults and say this is legitimate research this is legitimate science there was an error made by our politicians and our laws and this should have never happened but we're, let's just pick it up where it should be and let's help people that don't understand that help and well then because as soon as you know that it's hard to it's hard to argue against moving forward in a in an adult intelligent way I agree thank yeah, you yeah and that also speaks to something that's important to me is um, let's all be uh, 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 adults about this um, using these at raves and using it at parties, I all and we all, I think, understand the coming of age and the, the sort of party atmosphere and pushing the envelope. You're away from your parents, so you want to do things that they told you not to do. Um, but these are serious medicines, and um, I abhor the name shroom. To me, it's biological racism. Uh, it puts mushrooms into this category of being a party drug. Uh, I think they, they deserve much more respect than that, and. 
So, but I, I forgive and I understand, I don't want to be uh, paternal here, but I can't help but feel my paternal instinct. I understand why younger people would want to do this in a party setting, but I think a lot of the younger people I've met who have taken very large doses of this have realized that these are powerful medicines and they should be uh, respected as such. So I'd like to just put my arm around anyone out there that's in the partying scene and kind of corral them in and have a sincere discussion about the importance of this. And we can't go off the rails here. We can't make the mistake of the 60s and 70s exactly. and then have them, some highly publicized cases, publicized cases that that makes the politicians decisions untenable for them to vote in favor of this. So let's be careful. Agreed completely. Okay, I know you had something else you wanted to show. Um, yeah. Okay. So I like to be the devil's advocate, even against my own interests. Uh, but first, let's talk about the pros, the advantages of psilocybin mushrooms over pharmaceutical grade psilocybin. The advantages, I'm going to read this, and everyone else can read it as well. But psilocybin mushrooms are widely available, they're affordable, they're not controlled by pharmas, they've been grown at home, well established, long history cultural use. They have the entourage effect of, uh, benefit of psilocybin analogs. This is to be determined clinically. And the appeal of taking a natural substance uh, for many people um, is much more interesting than taking a pure pharmaceutical. So the disadvantages are exactly the opposite, not available outside of clinical trials. Um, it is controlled by pharmaceutical companies. Affordability, we don't know. And the, the investors are primarily driven by profit, not by social justice, uh, not for benefit of the commons. They want to make money, they want to make it quickly, and they want to maximize their profits to the disadvantage of any other interest. Well, the disadvantage of psilocybin mushrooms is they are variable in psilocybin and psilocybin content. There can be extraordinary variability. Those that grow it, or even those that you find outside, they can contaminate with molds or bacteria. There's no CGMP standards yet. There's no accountability because of the underground market. Um, there's lack of confidence for new wary consumers. I'll do a, another addition to this. Another big, big disadvantage is that people are not paying taxes. This is a huge friggin' issue with me. I pay a lot of money in taxes. These people are using the fire department. They're using the post office. They're you work, uh, wearing on, work, driving on streets made with public funds. They should be taxed. So the loss of tax revenue, I think, is a big disadvantage on the underground psilocybin mushroom um, you know, uh, market. Of course, the advantages are the CGMP with pharmaceutical companies are guaranteed quality, impurities are minimized, um, and there is accountability. So you know where to go to if you have an adverse event. Um, and for some consumers that I know, they'd much rather have a clinically prescribed pure pharmaceutical psilocybin than a natural form. And so there's two different camps, you know, um, that you have to address both of those. There is a pathway with the FDA for a botanical drug uh, to be developed. So natural medicines uh, do have a pathway for FDA approval once they are standardized. And we've come to learn to standardize to at least two markers of significance. That gets a little bit um, erudite here. But I see this as a people medicine movement versus profit medicine movement. And if we want to have the greatest benefit of reducing crime, of reducing the huge expense, both you know, in terms of monetary as well as, as a harm to our families and neighbors, then having these more widely available for the commons obviously serves the greatest good than having it only selectively available to rich people who can afford to go to Johns Hopkins for a $20,000 weekend session. I mean, literally. Um, not to throw John Hopkins under the bus, it's just that that is the, the ongoing expense for any individual going through a clinical study. So the future targets are looking at these different diseases and these different functions. And so I see something very interesting in immunity improvement. And I don't want to go on much further than this right now, but it's been very well established in many journals, uh, including the Lancet, that depression, psychological depression also leads to immune depression. Immune depression leads to psychological depression. 
So if you are depressed and anxious, you go to the doctor and you said, what's my chances of survival? And now I'm so sorry to tell you, you have a 90% chance of dying in the next two years. Well, that's not a very hopeful, you know, um, comment by your doctor. But if your doctor says, you know, if you can enhance your immune system, if you can be a happier person, more creative, then your immune system will, could give you one extra coefficient benefit of being able to better survive. So immunity is influenced by depression, and depression influences immunity. So we see from this meta study that mood increases, depression decreases. It's well established that your immune system is affected by your emotions. So I, this next slides that I, I am not going to show you, I'm, I, I need to reserve those for a medical community because they're a lot more sensitive and provocative, um, but this is a stepping stone that I see in the meta-analysis and just looking at the millions of people who die from cancer, how many of those would have a better immunological uh, uh, clinical outcome had they been microdosing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that data might be out there right now, folks. Uh, you, someone could do a retroactive meta-study and go back to the largest databases of cancer survivors beyond baselines and try to disambiguate whether any of them were microdosing, maybe not so much 10 years ago, but happening now since microdosing is so common, I think that data set actually is uh, you know, in the background being populated as we speak. So that's the type of things that Dr. Pam and I are really interested in. Wonderful. Dr. Pam, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I think he covered it. I think we have ample data to back up what Next. Uh, Okay. I know I know we've gone over time here, so we, we'll leave it at that. But I just wanted to thank you both so much. This is hugely impactful for our movement. I think that'll really help us to get headway with the Seattle City Council, and then hopefully UW can eventually get some funding. Um, as you know, we're, uh, Dr. Nathan Sackett is on our board, um, so we're working with him and, and your friend that you mentioned as well um, to try to make that happen. So I'm, I'm, I really feel like the intention behind this movement, and it's I feel like it's going to move quickly. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Both of you, really, it's such an honor to meet you both. Um, I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you so much. And one last thing I want to mention, we um, populated a website called mushroomreferences.com. We populated for physicians and researchers. It's unbranded, literally hundreds of references uh, for scientists and physicians to get them up the learning curve. Because the physicians, everyone's so busy. So we have you picked out the most important peer-reviewed references, and there's about 30 psilocybin clinical studies that, and articles that are in that website. Excellent. So go to mushroomreferences.com, um, and we update it about once a month, and there's just a cascade of reinforcing data coming through the scientific uh, literature that reinforces that these are paradigm-shifting medicines that can give great societal benefit. And so I want politicians, judges, and law enforcement, this will all make your jobs easier, your budgets more robust for being able to take care of social issues that are foremost of importance. And so I think this is a universal coefficient variable of benefit. Absolutely agree. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for all your thank you. Thanks for <laughs> thank doing you. Okay, we'll see you soon.